of all, I thank you. Say, I, first of all, I want to say thank you to Max and to Anna for organizing this. It was sort of felt like madness at the moment. Like why on earth would you put a breakfast on at 8.30 the week after uh, a very busy week in New York and Pittsburgh. But now we're here together trying to process and debrief. It's very great. <coughs> so thank you. I'm not gonna to dwell too much. Uh, Alden's covered a lot of the substance and I'm really keen to have uh, more of a discussion here from others. I wanna say a couple of points. Yes, gas is a big issue, right? The mixed signals we're sending. I noticed a lot of governments were out trying to um, address uh, the, what they call the risk of misperception, like particularly you know, uh, um, some colleagues from the German government uh, were on the ground saying, look, we need the gas now, but this does not undermine our longer term, um, or actually not just longer term, our immediate goal to sort of decarbonize. And they were there touting their very ambitious renewable energy targets and energy efficient targets. So I thought that was a that was a key point, like a key theme in all the on all the different discussions. But then again, on the other hand, they're sort of playing to the audience as well. It's a very climate clean energy audience they were speaking to. So that's what they were sort of emphasizing. But gas, finance obviously is an ongoing issue. Um, uh, uh, Alden, you know, with the US sort of touting the, you know, the billions in the Inflation Reduction Act to get the US economy rewired, and obviously the Europeans doing what they're doing with their European Green Deal. I think there's a gaping hole now for Europe, US, and others, Japan, Korea, etc., to figure out how we ramp up renewables um, as a response to this sort of energy crisis and how we figure out the finance flows to do that. So you could see that sort of gaping hole that again, still needs a bit of address addressing. Um, I am, um, rather than go through the list of the substance, I just wanna say a bit about how it feels. Like in New York, uh, at the UNGA and Climate Week, it feels a bit like sometimes at the COP, you know, you have governments coming together to cooperate, but this year was no exception. It just always feels a bit sort of disappointing for me personally, I should speak. I don't feel how I want to feel like governments coming together and taking this crisis as seriously as we want them to. I think it would feel very differently if they, you know, and as, as climate, as Alden said, climate was not the top priority for good reason. There's lots of other crises that uh, the world is dealing with. But again, I, I just found it all a bit sort of disappointing. As Alden said, the US being a no-show to the UN Secretary, Secretary General's meeting and then some of the Europeans no-show and it's just a bad look right now having a group of developing countries around the table to talk about climate um, and developed countries not being there. So I always just feel sometimes a bit, mm, we're trying really hard and it's just disappointing we're not quite there. But flip over to Pittsburgh and the feel to me, I'm talking personally, is very different. That's the Global Clean Energy Action Forum. Um, which is the Clean Energy Ministerial, I think it was C, uh, the SAM 13 and Mission Innovation 7, but the US put this other brand over it, the Global Clean Energy Action Forum, to tie them together and to pull together the threads about development of new technologies and deployment of technologies we have. Um, the feel there to me, I, I just always feel so much more like optimistic when I'm around those conversations because it's not an if, or a, like a when, it's like how, you know, it's like a how to can do sort of feeling. And the, the government to government collaboration, the business to business and the business to government just feels very different. And there were a ton of side events on yeah. every which technology, you know, for this net zero yeah. transition. So, sorry, I don't, I don't want to cut you off just so we, we come to the uh, Pittsburgh series in, in full oh, detail. Sorry. Okay, sorry, I'm so I, 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 But you already revealed your preference quite strongly <laughs> and publicly. I'm ahead. Sorry to upset the agenda. I'll just leave it there. Though. No, 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 no. My, this was, uh, my yeah. high then, sorry, my high and my low, I think was both Malpass, um, that clip of Malpass not being able to answer the question that burning fossil fuels is causing climate, climate change that was just that was my low, but then the high was how our broader community mobilized in response. And some of those stories uh, that followed and gave that story sort of the attention and the legs that it needed, that was also a high. And I think if I had to put money on it, I think Malpass you know, perhaps would be gone before the end of the year. And I think that is quite a, a telling sign. 
I'll leave it there, Max. I'm happy to come back well, later from Pittsburgh. So, sorry for cutting this off. I hope you, I hope you can come with the same positive energy in, in a few minutes about Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, I want to poke a little bit uh, my finger in the wounds of New York City, <laughs> and uh, and and hopefully also talk a little bit about positives. Uh, let's not forget about the positives. I mean, Denmark breaking the ice, uh, cracking the shell on loss and damage is of course huge. But then 13 million, even for a small country like Denmark, seems like really a very careful step. So now I wanna ask here, and that goes also to you, Claire, like what, what do you think? Is this like the beginning of, you know, are the floodgates open now? Are others gonna follow? Or is this so carefully positioned by Denmark that it might also be a one-off and not leading anywhere? Well, it's all done. I mean, I, I think this is an opening. I mean, I've worked on this issue for many years. Uh, loss and damage has been a, a really flashpoint in this process since the beginning, actually, the negotiations in 1991. But I think, as Simon Steele said in his AP interview, there's been a real evolution. And you see, we've moved from denial uh, to refusal to engage and discuss it. Now it's being discussed. We had the Glasgow Dialogues in Bonn. It, inevitably, we're going to have some forum for discussing it in, in Sharm El Sheikh. I think the question is, can the US, the EU, the UK, others put some meaningful proposals on the table to meet the need? I mean, the need is overwhelming. 13 million just begins to scratch the surface. We're talking billions on hundreds of billions that are ultimately needed here. So I think that's the real question. I, I should say one of the uh, low points for the US, I think, during the week was um, the interaction between my old friend and colleague Farhana Yamin and John Kerry, uh, where she pressed him on, will the US step up and provide leadership on loss and damage? And he basically said, we need to focus on mitigation and adaptation. Uh, we're talking trillions when it comes to loss and damage. You have to deal with reality. We're not going to get the money out of Congress. It was just not a very good look, again, for the U.S. So I think the U.S. and Europe and others really need to come to Sharm El Sheikh with a much more constructive plan uh, for how to deal with this crisis. They can't just say we don't want a new facility which is the demand of the G77 in China. Uh, if you're not going to allow that discussion to go forward, you have to have something meaningful on the table, and I don't think they do yet. Thank you, Alden, and Shane, also coming in. Yeah, no, I, I, I very much echo that. I mean, I think you know, it was important what Denmark did, because up until then, a lot of the developed country response had just been focused on insurance, and there wasn't a sense that public money was really on the table, and even though it is a small amount, breaking through that, that barrier, I think, is, is really critical and does set up the dynamics of the conversation going forward. And I think the second piece was also, as, as Alden said in his introduction, what happened around the bridge tower agenda. And I think this broader sense of, I think in the past, we've very much focused on loss and damage as climate impacts happen and we have to rebuild afterwards. Whereas I think this was a much broader sense of actually what does resilience mean here? Thinking about macroeconomy stability, thinking about debt, mm -hmm. thinking about how those things connect together. And I think there is a rich conversation to actually push into that space where I think we can make progress if, if, if there is political will to do so. Just one other thing to mention, which is the Secretary General in his opening remarks on Tuesday made a very bold call for basically clawing back some of the windfall profits that the fossil fuel industry is making, largely through no, no action of their own, but because of uh, President Putin's war in Ukraine, and saying that a good chunk of that money should be used, and not just for helping people in the northern countries that are suffering from high energy prices, but for loss and damage, and helping those in the south whose you know emissions uh, from the fossil fuel industry has condemned a, ever mounting climate impacts. And we'll see what the response is. There's some action, I think, in Europe. There's no prospect, I think, that the US Congress is going to do a windfall profits tax. But there may be some initiatives in Europe. There may be some other innovative finance uh, ideas like Mia's, Mia Motley's that can go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Can I just quickly come in, Anna from the Danish Embassy here? Oh, um, well, so I just wanted to, to, to join in. Thanks so much for, for mentioning. Uh, I think we've been really happy with seeing the amount of attention uh, it's gotten and, and fully agree with you well in terms of the size and number and what is needed. 
Um, I think one thing that's important from a Danish perspective, at least, is this was not something that our uh, government, uh, which is very climate friendly, this was actually an additional amount that came from uh, an agreement between uh, several parties in the, in, in the parliament. So it's, it's extra money, it's not taking out of, of uh, existing development mm -hmm. funds. Um, and, and then I think we know that there's been some, some also some, well, some confusion, some questions about what's the funding for and, you know, how, how is it? And I think that's something we are, especially from Copenhagen side, they're still trying to answer those questions. Um, uh, they've been very clear that this is also, we really see this as a step forward in terms of taking this and then taking the conversation forward. So I appreciate your questions and who could, who could follow on it and, and that on. Um, if I can ask maybe for, for the panel, panelists, uh, in terms of why do you see the, the US on this, right, and, and moving forward, is this, we know that there's, I know there's been a difficult conversation and we also, you know, you mentioned that the, the Congress and, and the 11 building right there, and that seems difficult, but I don't know if you could say a little bit about this, any opening from your side and how you see this? Yeah, yeah, Claire, if you want to say something, you, you have to just come in. Otherwise, we ping pong back to Arden. Yeah, well, I, I think this is something the administration is grappling with as, as we speak. What can they bring to the table? The reality is the Congress is not going to act on the President's $11.4 billion request before Sharm El Sheikh. There's going to be a continuing resolution in the December. It's going to be a lame duck discussion. And there's no real money in the President's proposal for loss and damage. It's, it's ramping up mit, uh, mitigation. It's ramping up adaptation by a factor of six, which is welcome. It's still not the U.S. fair share, but it's moving in the right direction. But the administration, I think, needs to rely on other sources, uh, the World Bank, other MDBs, maybe some things from, from some of the agencies that can act without uh, direct appropriations by Congress. But this is something they're, they're scrambling with. There is a lot of work going on, including by Taylor Dimsdale from E3G, who's not with us now. but. Uh, and others, world resources, and others that have been doing briefings and educational work on the Hill in Congress. Uh, there's actually a briefing that uh, Congressman Bowman uh, is hosting. It was scheduled for today. It's being postponed because of a conflict in his schedule. Uh, that's going to involve both some U.S. NGOs as well as Vanessa Nakate from Uganda, uh, a very forceful uh, climate youth advocate, uh, talking about the reality of loss and damage and the need for Congress to act. But but let's be clear that this is going to take work uh, to move hearts and minds on, on Capitol Hill and have them be supportive of some initiative uh, from the administration. Thank you, Alden. And you mentioned MAPAS or the World Bank again. And of course, there's been um, quite some movement uh, or reaction in within civil society on this. But even the White House responded with a statement late on Friday. It, it took them a while, uh, but then it came out what seemed to me relatively strongly um, against um, this reaction and, and the wording. And uh, of course, there's no decision yet uh, as to his professional future. But terms can be less than the official, I think the official term is five years, that would take to 24. What do you think are the odds now, or is this something that also the world doesn't need right now in this time of crisis um, to add this uncertainty, this disruption? Uh, what are your takes on this. Well, there's a couple of points there. I mean, I've been in Washington a long time and I can read the, the tea leaves. And when the White House press secretary is asked multiple times by reporters, does the president have confidence in Malpass? That's a slippery slope to the beginning of the end. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, and, and she indicated, uh, you know, again, several times how much uh, the White House and the president uh, did not agree with his statements. But this is something that was simmering even before New York. There's been dissatisfaction with his leadership. Uh, Secretary Yellen has, has pressed the World Bank to do more. John Kerry has pressed the World Bank to do more. They have not been impressed with the responses to date. And, and when you start noting that it takes a majority of shareholders uh, to remove a president of the World Bank midterm, that indicates to me that there are conversations going on behind the scenes about whether a majority can be assembled. You're already seeing names like Raj Shah being floated to replace him which again is another signal uh, that he's on, on very unfirm ground. So 
My guess would be that there there could be some action on this as soon as the annual meetings next month. But uh, you know, obviously they they want to make sure that if they do this, it's not going to be resisted uh, by very powerful shareholders on the board, and as you say, take a lot of political capital and 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 shake up the system and damage other things they want to get done. So when you say we have very powerful shareholders, is of course there's the U.S., but then I think number two is already Germany, right? There, there's there's Germany. I mean, China has has a, a role to play. India, others do. Maybe Maduro has some sense of this from <laughs> developing countries. I see Dagmara on the call. Maybe she has a take, or others, colleagues from the EU have a take on 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 how this played uh, in capitals on the other side of the pond. But but my sense is, um, you know, if I were him, I I wouldn't be. Uh, putting a long-term mortgage down in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who knows? There's always second life as a consultant and, no. and lawyer. So, so yeah, this is uh, very, very, very interesting. Do you want to come in on this, Maduro? To be honest, at this point of time, with everything that, is, that has been taking place between New York Climate Week and SEN, in terms of how the Malpas uh, uh, sort of comments have been perceived in India, it's not been covered as much. But what I would say is that I think from a developing country perspective, as well as just in terms of how World Bank is placed currently with all the conversations around, like the need for ramping up finance, the role that MDBs have to play in it, the JTP, I mean, the energy transition partnership discussion, just energy transition partnership discussions, as well as the accelerated coal transition retirement funds, etc. I don't think it makes sense for um, post a climate denier to be at the head of the institution that is right in the middle of these funds that need to deliver energy transition solutions. Um, so if even if it is a heavy political lift, I um, uh, even if it is a heavy political lift, I think the sooner that this transition, I mean the, the change takes place, I think the stronger the message would be that the world is serious and at least trying to look for solutions and have the right people at the head of it. Before I break or talk about anything further, I'm just going to move all breakables away from me. But we do have more dishes, so don't worry. Don't worry. This is wonderful. Yeah, I mean, just, just right there. I mean, I think now is the time for particularly the European Union and UK shareholders to really step up and make a stand on this. So I think it, you know they are a very significant proportion of the World Bank shareholding. They can have, along with the US, you know, a real say on the, on the future direction now. I think you know, last week was unacceptable in terms of his responses. I think now is the time for Europe to stand up and say that very clearly. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, thank you for this clear message on this. So we hope that um, people also on the call and in the room hear this. And uh, I think this is probably also shared by many across civil society and, and uh, also country governments alike. So let's hear and see and monitor how this evolves. Coming back um, once again to New York, um, to the UN um, climate process, the 100 billion. I mean, of course, we talked about loss and damage, and it's, it's, a, it's a great process step. But of course, the 100 billion, somewhat separate, uh, although related, obviously. Um, has there been an update? I, I remember, I mean, you know, this, this was uh, certainly something that we still have homework to do on, uh, but also getting closer to the goal. So has there been any updates uh, in the last week regarding the 100 billion? Well, there was a lot of discussion on it, um, both uh, Jennifer Morgan from Germany and Stephen Gilbo from Canada, who are the two countries charged with doing the update report on the 100 billion. We're in New York doing a lot of both public and private consultations. It's a little surreal for me since they were both uh, colleagues in the environmental movement. I was actually Jennifer's first boss when she was the coordinator of US Climate Action Network, and now I have to lobby her, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there, this is something, and again, it's, it's, it's in a sense, it's symbolic because we know 100 billion only scratches the surface but it's a very deep sort of trust issue and confidence builder and a number of leaders mentioned it a number of ministers mentioned it the developed countries really need to get this done and get it over the finish line and then move on to what comes next but ways to mobilize hundreds of billions for both loss and damage adaptation and, and mitigation uh, so i think that report is scheduled to come out 
on some time in early October. People will be watching to see not only what it says about the overall 100 billion, but how are the developed countries doing and moving towards meeting the goal they committed to in Glasgow of doubling adaptation finance to 40 billion a year by 2025. Uh, and what, if anything, do they have to say about uh, what they will do on loss and damage from a developed country perspective? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Lot, lots more to do. And and I want to also bring in uh, Madura, if you want to come in on the topic. And then, of course, other people here in the room and on the Zoom, if you want to come in, you can raise your hand electronically uh, and and talk or, or also use the chat. I think Anna will monitor this. So Madura. I think on sort of shifting the billions and the billions that are required, we are not, there is effort being made through the various initiatives that are underway, but I don't think that it's at the pace that it's required to try and meet the solutions that we need this decade. And um, there have been positive signals over the last one year but I think this will be something very important going into COP27. And unless there is sort of real movement and money on the table that can help, that can be demonstrated or at least intention to do that, the trust building aspect is going to be very difficult. And as we see solutions that are being looked at, there is a lot of optimism on renewables, but there is also an increased conversation across the world on fossil fuels and the role that fossil fuels have to play in the short run and the money that's been pumped into meeting these short run requirements and the contrast becomes a little uh, stark. So there needs to be a significant ramp up on um, the financing requirements that are there, as well as the solutions that can help smaller countries access these um, sort of finance, uh, the mobilized capital at affordable rates. Yeah, yeah, that's that's another big topic. It's a big, yeah. That's where we go into the trillions domain. There, there were a number of discussions and, and events. Uh, the Bloomberg uh, Philanthropies hosted event, I think it was on Wednesday, where Bloomberg announced they would add 15 countries to the list of countries they're helping make the energy transition. Uh, there was a lot of discussion of the Just Energy Partnership, South Africa, India, Indonesia, others, and what can happen on that by Sharm El Sheikh to enable those countries to signal an increase in ambition. So this was, this was front and center, and there were some very positive uh, indications there that, that things are moving on some fronts, but as Madura said, not at the pace we need. Right, right. Good. Um, we can also come back to the topic later, unless anybody had immediate questions or comments to add. Then let's leave New York City um, for now. And uh, it, yes. Maybe if you allow, I will come in um, just yes. briefly, um, just to provide colleagues with a few perspectives of, of, of how uh, essentially my leadership, uh, European Union's leadership, um, EVP uh, was, um was perceiving uh, New York. Um, um, he was actually not very pessimistic uh, leaving uh, the climate week. Um, he had thought um, there were some meaningful conversations between developed and developing uh, countries on loss and damage. Um, I think he is um, on the line of, of John Kerry when it comes to what needs to be done. He was emphasizing process um, and in fact definition of what lo loss and damage is and establishing the process, but he was quite clear that he didn't feel a new facility uh, would be easy to be established and also uh, necessary for this. So he was more kind of like on the on the line of like, okay, let's, let's see what we can uh, jointly do uh, with developing finance, for example, um, he was saying that the IMF is is really um, showing the way, and that uh, clearly the World Bank uh, needed to uh, follow suit, and that clearly one needs to define the, uh, the redesign essentially or reform uh, development finance. Um, so that was essentially what I uh, took away from from him as uh, as. Um, as, as, as um, you know, uh, given that uh, he was in uh, many more meetings that I uh, personally attended, uh, my personal impression was uh, that there was a lot of emphasis from the Egyptians on the adaptation. Um, so I don't know um, whether, um, you know, uh, that will be 
you know, from the chair uh, side of, 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 of the uh, equation, uh, much more emphasized than loss and damage, but it felt like loss and damage in the speeches that I've heard from the leadership, Egyptian's leadership, foreign minister, uh, who will be the incoming president, the president um, who is the incoming president, um, he was more focused on adaptation than on uh, loss and damage. Yeah, maybe just to say on that, I, I think that's right, Dagmar, that, that has been a major focus of Egypt. And of course, there's a U.S.-Egypt initiative on adaptation for Africa, which is going to be interesting to watch. I think the Egyptians are going to push on adaptation. But one thing I failed to note is that early in the week, uh, the Egyptian foreign minister, Shakri, announced that he had asked uh, uh, Jennifer uh, Morgan and the Chilean environment minister, uh, Maiza Rojas, uh, to co-lead on ministerial consultations on loss and damage. Uh, I mentioned Jennifer. Um, Isa is a brilliant uh, PhD climate scientist. I work pretty closely with her in, in Madrid and, and in Glasgow, and she is now Chile's environment minister. I can't think of a better pair of women to lead the conversation and try to lead us out of this uh, procedural and political morass that we've been in on loss and damage. So clearly Egypt knows that it needs to address loss and damage and not have a huge agenda fight. This is the one issue that could bring down the entire COP if it's not handled well. And I think Egypt now understands that. But you're right, they are juggling adaptation and loss and damage and making sure they don't rob Peter to pay Paul or Peter, Paul, and Mary uh, when it comes to funding. Uh, we have to figure out a way to, to ramp up aid for loss and damage while also dramatically accelerating uh, aid for adaptation. As Mia Motley said in her Friday Kofi Annan lecture, uh, we've documented that every dollar spent on resilience before a disaster saves us seven dollars in post-disaster recovery and by the way it saves a lot of lives uh, so we definitely need to address both adaptation and loss and damage thank you thank you both dagmar and alden and now let's switch our minds focus on energy energy innovation going to pittsburgh um it was of course primarily hosted by the American side. So there were a lot of focus events uh, showcasing American views and, and uh, uh, stakeholders, but not only, it was also an international event and a lot of uh, ministerial delegations came uh, from both the Global North and the Global South. And we had a lot of business, uh, business partners there. We had a lot of uh, CSOs there and I think five or six thousand people total. So again, over a hundred side events, we by no means will be able to cover everything in the remaining time, but let's give it a try. And I start with Madura since, yeah. since you spent a good amount of time there and you were even part of events. So let's hear from you. What are your takeaways from the Global Clean Energy Action Forum? Thanks so much, Max. So I have to say it is a better reflected, I think, um, though, the Global Clean Energy Action Forums, or at least my sentiments about the Global Clean Energy Action Forum, very sunny, with occasional bits of clouds and rains around. Um, so I did think that there was a sense of optimism at the Global Clean Energy Action Forum, um, that renewables could deliver the solution, uh, renewables are the solutions and could deliver the agenda for 2030, decarbonization agenda for 2030, and they have the potential, should there be sort of accelerated um, support of different stakeholders to ramp up and um, help in meeting a range of different energy access, security, affordability, as well as uh, affordability needs. Um, I think um, it was really great to see how sort of the business, a range of different innovations that were taking place, not just in technology, but also conversations around uh, specific financial solutions, in fact, that could help in sort of reducing the risk for developing countries or make sort of finance more affordable, for example, currency hedging risk. So that was really useful, like interesting to see. Uh, I wanted to actually mention this was launched at Anga, but the Global Offshore Wind Alliance that I think Denmark had uh, sort of launched along with US. And there is again, like a lot of focus on offshore wind as a, as a solution that can help in improving the, um, the, the flexibility of renewables. So these were really great positives. 
And um, lastly, I'd like to mention the solar work stream that was launched by ISA in partnership with IRENA, which had uh, US, India, UAE, uh, I'm forgetting a couple of other countries that were a part of uh, launching the work stream. The idea of the solar work stream is to focus on essentially um, the collaborations, policy support that is required to accelerate solar in particular. Um, and also in terms of understanding how do you sort of de-risk the supply chains. So there are emerging conversations that have been, that have been really positive at SEM. Um, I will touch, touch briefly upon the negative, but while we are talking about the positive conversations, I think it's also sort of helped in identifying what, who and how, you know, what are the things that we need to do immediately to try and sort of accelerate the renewables, what, who, all need to be in the conversation and how do we sort of get towards it. Um, so in, in terms of the bots, essentially, how do we sort of look at tripling down investments, improving, bringing in newer stakeholders into the conversations because there is political will in at least accelerating renewables, but how do we get in conversation, the, the technocrats, the, in, the electricity distribution companies, etc., better into the conversations, can we sort of devolve also into elab into enabling subnational cooperations. So those were broadly the kind of ideas that we would be useful to take forward from this SEM to the next SEM in India, where these conversations can be deepened further. Um, in terms of the negative, I think this was mentioned by other speakers as well in the uh, earlier. I thought that the focus on gas was a bit much for a clean energy ministerial forum. It was mentioned right from the inaugural to the closing ceremony, which was quite jarring, to be honest. Um, and uh, no matter how we present gas, it's not going to be clean or clean or it's not going to be green rather. Um, that was definitely problematic. The other thing was that while there is optimism on renewables uh, potential to deliver, I think the what was sort of mentioned by the IRENA, um, by, uh, by IRENA as well as IEA, that the investment required needs to triple uh, and, and that needs to ramp up immediately. So there should, there needs to be significant focus on that. And the last thing I would say is that it's not a negative as much as just a comment that while we're talking about renewables growth, a lot of focus is given on the gigawatts that are required to meet, to, uh, to meet sort of the targets. But we also need to look at significantly uh, what solutions can distributed renewable energy sort of provide, especially as we are looking at also meeting the SDGs by 2030, not just the climate goals. And do uh, and distributed renewable energy solutions do have uh, the potential in addressing several of uh, both technical as well as social aspects. Um, so while Gigawatts help in achieving the bigger numbers. Let's look at the policies and the support that even DRE solutions are um, be needed. Thank you, Madhura. Yeah, also a very good point um, that it's not just climate. I mean, we mentioned it talking about the UN. There's a food crisis. There's a debt crisis. So obviously, if if projects can deliver on more than one criterion that's that's a huge win and a need actually we can have narrow focused uh, projects um, only be rolled out um, also very interesting what you said about involving new stakeholders and I'm curious also to see I haven't seen any statistics about participation like how many countries were present my impression was it was international but not very diverse in the sense from international. There were certain countries there in a the large number, and then many countries not at all. Um, I did not see many people from Latin America, at least from my interactions. Um, but this would be interesting to see also how this will be maybe different mm -hmm. next year. Uh, we are pushing towards the last half hour. Um, Shane and Claire, you also were both in Pittsburgh. so. Let's start with Shane here in the room and then um, go to Claire. And then, of course, anybody else, also, you're more than welcome to join in. Shane. Thanks, Max. Um, yeah, I mean, my big takeaway from Pittsburgh is we're not going to fail our own climate change because of a lack of technology. 
we will fail because of a lack of political will. And I think the technology was really present there in the room. And then, you know, as, as everyone's commented on, I think there was a really sense of, of positivity, of energy that we can actually do this. Um, and I think that that is really important. I think that's the distinction you make is, is, is there. Um, you, know, you can often divide the world up into technology makers and technology takers. And this was an event dominated by the technology makers and that prosperity agenda is you know, at the core of, of, of driving climate forward. But we mustn't do that at the, at the expense of those countries that don't have the innovative capacity at the moment. And that was where sort of E3G, I think, had sort of you know, a couple of engagements. Firstly, we hosted dinner with a group of colleagues, some people represented here, looking at specifically renewables diplomacy. Yeah, we've done a lot historically on gas diplomacy, oil diplomacy, we know what that is. Renewables diplomacy is different. It's not about sending contracts for supply. It's actually much more about capacity building, innovation, supply chain management, thinking about critical earths, minerals. All of those things make this a much more complex challenge. And I think we haven't invested in those sort of areas sufficiently as we go forward. And the second thing that these trees are working on very much is alliances for climate safety. That actually you have a lot of innovation and energy in the room, but how can we add these up to be more than the sum of their parts? There is this risk at the moment that everything always has to be a new initiative, a new thing somewhere else, and we just spiral off into a thousand different directions. It's how do we actually bring it back and concentrate that energy so that it actually becomes a transformational force? And I think we need to sort of learn some lessons from that for the future GCEAFs. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. Uh, as they as they come forward uh, in the future. Thanks. Yeah, thank thank you, Shane. Um, very very good points. Also giving us some more homework for for after after these the week. Let's say let's let's just say after the week. Claire, what are your takeaways from Pittsburgh? Okay. Um, so, well, I love the focus on the gigawatts. As Madora said, like how do we build the gigawatts? Right? How do we meet these targets? Um, it's not, um, I also found it confusing. Everyone has an agenda. Everyone's pushing a particular technology, hydrogen, biomass, you name it, right? And um, it makes me personally want to look for like, who is the arbiter of this? Like, where is the plan? What is green? Like, what do we need now while the technologies are being developed for the future? Like, there's a lot of, yeah, I, a lot of hype around some of these technologies and I was searching for someone that could help me just figure out the what was real really happening on the ground you know where are the gigawatts really going to come from so and you turn for you turn to people then that's got a good sense of a roadmap of the pathways so it made me like want to look seek those out read those reports or so have a better sense of um, what's hype and what's real in terms of the technologies um, interesting to know like Medora said and I think in the chat the next two years, and then you have India hosting next year and then Brazil the following year. And as hosts of these clean energy platforms, they're also hosts of the G20. And both the Indian and the Brazilian governments at the closing ceremony sort of noted the interlinkages between the G20 platform uh, around political leadership and the GCAF, I don't know, whatever, you know, GCF, like the SEM and EMI platforms. And both talked about how we build those interlinkages, as Shane said, between the technology, but also the politics. So that would be interesting over the next two years. I think we really have to put some thought into how we leverage these moments. The other takeaway for me is it's on us then to develop, I think, real concrete ideas. A lot of people I'm talking to in government here, there and everywhere, are just capacity constrained, and they get the need for new thinking on ramping up renewables or debt. But they want real sort of ideas, right? We've got to, I think for us, we, we can't just keep looking at the problems. It's on us to actually try and put together some um, concrete ideas of the how, right? You know, what, it, what how do we want debt? How do we want, what's the platform like for renewables ramp up? Um, as Shane said, it's beyond just the technology, the system approach. The other takeaway was the skills issue. Um, we talked about many of the other challenges or the impediments, but the workforce capacity uh, skills piece of this again and how we collaborate on that to put that piece on steroids it's sort of very piecemeal at the moment so a lot of a lot of um, um but, but these are all in that spirit of okay we can do this we will do this to figure out you know how we're going to collaborate to do it but we've got to get more concrete about how we do that Maybe just one comment connecting some of these dots together. I mean, there was a lot of, of focus, obviously, in Pittsburgh around sectoral decarbonization, 
a whole range of sectors. The, the Glasgow Breakthroughs Report was issued by the IEA in, a, in ARENA and others, and I, and I guess they're going to now be the official sort of process where the scorekeeping is done on this. We have the deep decarbonization roadmaps for these sectors well laid out by the IEA, the IPCC, others. In Sharm El Sheikh, we're going to have to adopt an agenda for the mitigation work plan uh, for this decade to get the 45% reduction we need in emissions by 2030. Uh, we hosted with WRI a private uh, workshop for parties a couple of weeks ago as they think about the submissions they're going to make on what that program might look like. And a lot of them were focusing on the sectoral decarbonization piece. How do we bring in the sort of good news story from the GCEF and others, uh, the, the Climate and Clean Air Forum that's hosting a methane uh, forum here this, this week in Washington and others, deforestation. How do you bring all this into the UNFCCC process, which traditionally has been around negotiations? Now we need to shift to implementation. And culturally, that means a mind shift as well. We have to shift from take no prisoners negotiators to radical collaborator doers. And we're, let's be honest, we're not there yet. Uh, but I think this mitigation work program, building on Pittsburgh, building on some of these other initiatives is where you can bring in some of the positive energy that colleagues saw in Pittsburgh into the UNFCCC process in, in Sharm El Sheikh around mitigation. Thank you, Alden. Also, directly going to, to the last segment where we want to see what, what this actually means for the future leading towards COP and beyond. I want to go back to Pittsburgh real quick because obviously we talk a lot about energy and it, in the name it's Energy and Climate um, or Clean Energy Action Forum. Um, my question is industrial decarbonization. You mentioned this all in the sectoral strategies and uh, especially clean steel, but also other sectors of course of relevant like cement certainly. Um, and related to the steel question, the hydrogen question, like I, I don't know, have you counted how many events there were about hydrogen at, uh, in Pittsburgh? Has anybody a uh, rough idea? Not an exact number, but I think there was one every quarter of yeah. a day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every so, quarter so, hour. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Perhaps. <laughs> yeah. So cer certainly a lot of events, uh, some of them competing at the same time, yeah on the same topics, uh, very, very challenging. It seems there is a lot of talk. This links to what you said, Claire, about how much of this is hype and how much of this is actual reality. We know that in, in direct, immediate contribution, of course, solar and wind are what, what are there to, to deliver right away. Um, just, I mean, I sat through a very lengthy hydrogen session and. I mean, the percentage of clean hydrogen in, in the world is, is minuscule. Yeah, it's, it's almost inexistent. And the amount of talk we have about it in com contrast to that is really interesting. So it's a big question. How much of this uh, positivity is also taking energy away from the solutions that are actually there and are actually working and are misdirecting our efforts? This is kind of like a uh, kind of a provocative question here into the room, to the audience. And I want to hear from all of you, and maybe we start this time with Claire, since you brought up the hype term, um, so, so you kind of directed me in that direction. Yeah, Claire, if you, if, you want, if you want a minute to confer with the advisors. I think it's your son. But yeah. <laughs> Claire, if, if you're ready, Sorry, say that again. Yeah, my mind. Oh, no, no, no. no, we're talking about, I said there was a lot of talk of hydrogen, um, a lot of hydrogen events, but there is almost no clean hydrogen available and uh, certainly none traded and there's almost no clean steel being made. So there was a uh, disproportionate amount of attention on these technologies. And while we have technologies that are ready to deliver right now mm -hmm. that can bring emissions reductions right now. Uh, was that kind of misleading us? Was that the, the well, misdirecting I us? I don't know if it's misleading or misdirecting. I mean, you know, there's a lot of um, 
well, there's a lot of politics around that, right? You know, why they, why we sort of uh, push on certain solutions like CCUS, hydrogen, et cetera. There's the political um, agenda there, but there's also like, you know, a political economy. There's lots of people in industry groups, in companies, in startups that are pushing their solution. So I, I don't, you know, I think they're doing what they do in the system. Um, but again, I think we have to be smart about that. I was struck, and again, I want to public, I want to print out and read out all the reports that were published last week. I mean, there must have been hundreds. One in particular, the IEA apparently published a report on hydrogen. And in one of the side events, they taught like numbers. And I want to get my head around those numbers, like what's being produced now, what's being used now, what platforms are developing green hydrogen that could displace current use hydrogen. So I think, you know, we've got to get smarter so we stay ahead of the game and we know kind of what the real, real agenda is, right? And so we don't just, we, um, um, and as Shane said, there's a massive need to ramp up renewables, the technologies we have, we know that work, as well as the en energy, energy efficiency and system demand reduction and systems approach. These are all part of the solution and we need to sort of do more of what we know works and what we have available today and not just, and, and, and interrogate these other new technologies, um, not dismiss, but interrogate, so we know really what's what. I mean, Shrute is putting some comments in the chat, I'd be interested in other people's views as well, what they came away with um, from Pittsburgh and how they navigate this terrain, all these new promising technologies with what's really happening on the ground. I mean, it's a challenge for all of us, I imagine. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Anna, if you can read out the comments in the chat, that, that would be helpful because we can't see them here. Yeah, the last one was Claire, so I'll, I'll um, slide you the down one. Okay, and I'm just noting that Laura Tierney is on with the Business Council, and I know, Laura, you and, and Lisa and others were very engaged in Pittsburgh around a series of events. Part of the, the Global Clean Energy Action Forum was actually a business forum in addition to SAM and MI, and I'm just wondering if, if you're able to share any sort of takeaways from the BCSE's perspective of what came out of, of Pittsburgh and some of these technology issues. Hi, Alden, thank you. Um, this is Laura here. Um, you know, there was just so much going on. I heard that from a lot of our members that um, we were, I mean, obviously we were quite pleased that there was a, a strong business um, showing and a lot of opportunities for our members to engage. And just, um, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, if you consider the, our delegation of, of companies that had exhibits, uh, participated in round tables, we had several CEOs participate in the building decarbonization round table that was one hour long on Thursday, also in the electricity grid of the future. Um, and we had two side events, one on building decarbonization and one on community investment and engagement by utilities and, and how they're managing the energy transition. So um, we, we appreciated the diversity of business solutions that were put forward. Um, I don't have a comment on overemphasis on one technology or the other technology, um, but I will say in the conversations that I heard, you know, you know in, uh, amongst our members at the conference, a lot of it obviously was um, you know, first and foremost, a lot of positive energy and optimism around the fact that we have, you know, the three bills together and all of the implementation that has um, to go forward for the U.S. domestic um, energy transition. But more importantly, I, I heard a lot of the companies talking about managing the practical implementation of, of those bills, um, that we are embarking upon a economic transition um, you know, for how our country uh, produces its energy. Um, and then um, a lot about the human transition. I think that was a big takeaway for me, both from the main stage comments that I was able to hear. And then, I, then also on the smaller scale of what I heard our member companies talking about, um, whether that is uh, workforce development, um, better engagement with the community and corporation of various stakeholders, and making sure that everyone is um, brought along in this transition. And I will share Max's general comment, like um, did not have the ability to connect with as many international delegates as we would have liked. And we definitely try to get that information from the Department of Energy team. Um, and thanks to E3G because you all helped kick off our connection with Maria to Julian and her, her staff, but clearly they were just overwhelmed with um, 
what they had to pull off. And so um, we recognize, I think, I mean, I think the time was really too short, um, I think. And, and again, there wasn't enough time for me to go to every and anything other than the events that we had. But I do think the business forum discussions were informative, the ones that I were able to pop into for like five minutes, 10 minutes at a time. So unfortunately, if, if, if the U.S. could do another global clean energy action, you know, make it with greater regularity, I would love to see it a couple days. I mean, the format of the and the openness of the event was really quite remarkable, I thought. Yeah, thank, thank you, Laura. I, I can only agree with that. It was really very open and uh, certainly we had also people joining, local people from Pittsburgh who just decided to come. So it was very low barrier, um, easy to join um, and a great opportunity to engage with very high level and cutting edge um, leaders in their field. Shane, you wanted to also come in regarding Pittsburgh and the technologies. Yeah, I, th I think with, with respect to the hydrogen question, you know, there's a saying in politics that if you're explaining, you're losing. Uh, and I think the fact that we put the hydrogen question so centrally often, I think, is in and of itself a challenge. And it means that we focus the conversation around that, not the other solutions. So I think now, more than ever, the crucial thing now, you know, as, as Alden described, the poly crisis is what will deliver on the terms and the timetable of the, of the crisis that we need to respond to. And when we look at the war in Ukraine now and the responses that are necessary, this winter, next winter, the winter after is when we have to really deliver. And the technologies that will do that are efficiency and renewables. That, that, is, that is the answer. That isn't that there shouldn't be another conversation about longer term technologies, but if we're not taking the signal from the current crisis that we have to focus on the next three winters and what we can do now, we are really losing. And I think we need to take that away very quickly as, as we get forward. I think on the broader point, and you know, it was it was great to see so many business and other participants there. I think there is this interesting question around who needs to be in the room now. We know that as we move into the phase of delivery, it's not going to be the smooth curves that you see on those IEA forecasts of one technology gradually glides off the system as another technology comes up. It is going to be much bumpier, it's going to be much rougher. And therefore, how do we actually get the right people in the room there? Do we need more trade people and people who are trade negotiators alongside technology experts and those sort of things? And I think we do need to actually invest in what are the right convening spaces. And I think it was really interesting. I think GCEF did have a new set of people coming together and that's really welcome. But I think we should continue to look at how we innovate in that space. Very good, very good. That also steers us into the last segment, the road ahead. I want to give everybody who wants to ask questions or add to these summaries an opportunity to come in now, both here in the room and also Zoom participants, because we only have 13 minutes left at this point. So if, if, if you do have questions, I think Anna is monitoring the chat. Uh, you can type it there or you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself. It's a small enough group to just uh, jump in. I don't know. Um, any any impressions, Oliver? Did you want to come in? Okay. Oh, sorry. There. Sure. Um, I was just I was talking to Claire about just sort of like our, our general impressions. Um, and for me, this is my first uh, UNGA first Climate Week. Unfortunately, I didn't go to Pittsburgh, um, but I thought. It was very interesting interpersonally to see sort of our mixture of optimism and, and pessimism. I felt like most of the time we were often complaining with each other, um, which I guess you could take as a bit of a pessimistic take. But I think there was a lot of optimism there as well. And we could sort of see and start to build our collective visions. And I think there's also something very special about everyone being in the same place um, at the same time and seeing people face to face and not only seeing people face to face in our more professional capacities, but then maybe later on into the into the night and having this sort of human connection, I thought was uh, really something special, um, at least for my sort of first impressions uh, of the week. But yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Oliver. Now, we only have a few minutes left and um, we touched already a little bit on basically homework, what's to be done, both leading towards COP, but also beyond then. And we have kind of 
two tracks hopefully leading in the same direction. One is how to work uh, on a very practical level with the new, um, with, the, with the next uh, clean energy ministerial mission innovation uh, host country being uh, India, but also then of course it's also the G20 presidency. So it's actually also uh, actually matters in, in diplomatic terms uh, significantly next year but it's upcoming and we always have the situation with time that Laura mentioned, both on the organizer side, but also of course on the influencer side, there's never enough time it seems. We always start too late and then things get rushed last minute. So how can we maybe be ahead of the curve? And the same thing, I mean, we are getting very close now to the final mile or the final hundred yards towards COP and Sharm el Sheikh. But of course, that's also not the end. The world will keep turning. And then we have another COP28 and in the uh, United Arab Emirates afterwards, which is also already on the horizon, maybe as a good thing, uh, but definitely also something to already anticipate. So I want to hear from our speakers, from our panelists, but also, of course, from anybody in the room, what they think we should focus on right now. And I found very interesting what you said on bringing these together, because that's really where this is lacking. And that also links to what Shane said about bringing maybe trade people in with this, which is yet another group of people who are not usually at the climate negotiations, but also not obviously at the clean energy uh, ministerials. So how do we proceed? What are recommendations? What are, uh, what's our homework, basically? Where do we want to start? Who wants to mention first? Alden. Yeah, I mean, kick off. I mean, I, I think we're looking at a series of events over the next two months. The COP, obviously, is one, but also the IMF World Bank meetings next month, I think, are going to be key, because that's really where the rubber meets the road on addressing these multiple crises. A lot of this comes down to finance and reforming the international financial architecture. The Bridgetown Initiative is out there. You've got the, the global uh, uh, investment uh, idea, global public investment initiative. Uh, there's a lot of conversations going on about sort of Bretton Woods 2.0 and, and Simon Steele is talking about that, the new executive secretary. So that's a very important moment, I think, to sort of tee up what can happen at the COP. And then, of course, the beginning of the second week of the COP, you've got the G20 Leader Summit in Bali. And I think there's a lot of questions, given the Ukraine crisis, uh, given the standoff between, you know, uh, the U.S. and China and other geopolitical dynamics, what Indonesia can make at that moment. My sense from the U.S. and the EU that I've talked to is they're trying to avoid any backsliding from last year from Naples and from Rome under the Italian G20 and kind of hang on for the Indian presidency next year. They're not expecting big breakthroughs, big, big moments. But of course, if leaders are able to collaborate and send some positive signals on finance, on impacts, on loss and damage, on decarbonization in Bali, that can make the ministers in Sharm el Sheikh's job much easier at the end of the week. On the other hand, if there's breakdown and polarization and clashes between leaders, ministers are going to be paralyzed in, in, in Sharm el Sheikh. They can't overrule their leaders if you're Chinese or Russian or American or European. Uh, so that's going to be a very, very important moment. And of course, uh, the first Tuesday of the COP, we're going to have the midterm elections here in the U.S. And I was in Marrakesh in 2016, waking up uh, very early on that Wednesday morning to find out that Hillary Clinton was not our next president <laughs> and having to explain to the world what that meant for U.S. politics and policy, for climate, for momentum. I think the Americans in Sharm El Sheikh are going to have a similar uh, task when it comes to whatever the results of the midterm elections mean for U.S. leadership, particularly on climate finance, but also on the IRA and mitigation. Uh, so there's a lot happening in the next two months, and, it, and you need to not see it as moment by moment driven, but have an integrated strategy, which I think is what Mia Modley and others are trying to do is put forward a more organic collective vision of where we need to go, which then needs leaders and finance ministers to populate it, not the environment ministers, foreign ministers, negotiators that will be in Sharm el Sheikh. Yeah, exactly. It's pointing to kind of a weakness or a challenge of the current system of um, 
multilateral and, and, and uh, plurilateral uh, convenings around the world. Uh, and I was hoping we would not talk about the midterms, but you, you had to bring it up. But uh, we're, PTSD we're just, from Paris. <laughs> <Paris. laughs> we're just, just going to ignore that part for, for now. Um, Shane, you wanted to come. Yeah, I, I think sort of very much building on, on, on all the points. I mean, I think you know, no cop is a cup final. I don't know what the appropriate US term Super Bowl or, or World Series. Uh, this cop really isn't a cup final. And I, and I think we need to sort of have this in context of, of this is part of a longer sequence. Uh, and this you know, reflects the fact that we're not negotiating a new agreement, we're making the Paris Agreement work. And that's the critical thing that we need to be focused on and, and looking at that. And therefore, I think what we do need to focus on COP as exactly as, as Alan was saying is, it's the place where we draw together the threads of everything else that's been happening in the world and we do the ambition check. And that's the, that's the critical moment. And we saw that last year at, at COP26, that you really do need to do that at the COP. You know, the difference between the ambition that we've got at COP26 versus the G20 shows the value of the UN multilateral process, shows the value of having the small island states and the developing countries in the room with a clear voice. And therefore, the COP is the legitimate process which we have to defend in that space. But a lot of the creative energy is going to be things and initiatives that exist outside the COP. And therefore, we need to draw those links back in. And I think that's the job that we need to kind of focus on. Um, but yeah, I think we do need to be clear about sort of the expectations that we're setting up for this year. This isn't going to be you know, that kind of big bang COP moment. This is going to be kind of a, a working COP, shall we say. And there will be tensions and disagreements. And sometimes, you know, there's a long history in the actual student negotiations that you, know, you do have to surface those tensions and disagreements in order to make progress, but necessarily that can be multi-year. And I think we need to anticipate that that might be the case this year as well. Yeah, yeah, great. Also, great to already anticipate um, the, the following years to think more multi-annual uh, rather than short-term. Um, Madura, what are your thoughts regarding you know, the road ahead. I think as Alden and Shina mentioned, I think in this COP, what we are hoping for is that there's a consolidation of ambition and at least not a backsliding on ambition. It's important right now for, given all the tensions that are going on and the conversations that may happen at G20, that this COP maintains the sort of momentum. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not expecting, I'm. I'm not hoping for it to sort of further it uh, dramatically ahead. It is, however, going to set a tone for the conversations to happen next year, at least from an Indian perspective, with G20 SEM uh, happening over here, uh, in India, G7 presidency in Japan, and um, and uh, uh, the COP in, uh, in Dubai. So I think uh, this, for me at least, is hoping that the progress at least maintains so that we can sort of pick up the conversations, hopefully in a more positive note, and the re-energized uh, sort of vigor going in the next year. Great, great. And you see, we totally managed to avoid uh, talking about domestic energy policy in India very gracefully <laughs> in one and a half hours. Clear, clear. Uh, what is your take on the road ahead? What is uh, what needs to be done? What do we need to do? What do others need need to do to bring everything together and to uh, make progress where it needs to be done? I think we need to get more concrete. So what, rather than say the need for something, put proposals on the table as to what it could look like. I think we need to connect some dots, and I like. I like that we were working across these different spaces. So pulling in what was going on in New York into Pittsburgh and vice versa, as well as other countries like the European capitals and India, Brazil. So I think we need to work across different uh, processes and, and connect a lot of the dots. Um, onwards to the annuals. I think also we need to sort of pass out our priorities so they don't all just get blurred. Like this week, you know, we, you know, New York, we had some particular agenda items to push, loss and damage, finance, Bridgetown, et cetera, and ambition. In Pittsburgh, we had a set agenda. I think the annuals coming up, we know what we need to push there on finance, MDB reform, debt, SDRs, et cetera, the whole architecture piece. And then back to the political around the COP and the midterm. So busy rest of the year, break over Christmas, and then let's do it all again next year. Got to keep on keeping on. 
Maybe just one more point. We didn't talk about domestic coal in India. We also didn't talk much about China. And uh, I think China kept a very low profile in New York deliberately. Uh, President Xi, of course, did not come. No earth shaking uh, news out of China. But after the 20th Party Congress next month, there's a lot of questions about how China is going to play, both at the COP and in the G20. We saw some discouraging signals out of the Environment Minister G20 meeting where China was kind of having some buyer's remorse on the aim for 1.5 degree deal in, in Paris and, and, the, and the Glasgow reinforcement of that and, and saying two degrees was more scientifically feasible as I heard from people in the room. I mean, I think that's a real question. What, what signals are we gonna get from China at the COP, at the IMF World Bank, at the G20? And I know Kate and others are in the room. We probably don't have time to do it, but maybe informally, we can we can have a little follow up on that because that's a that's the the sort of big elephant in the room that we really didn't touch on much today. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's definitely a necessary follow up. Also, how to engage China? Obviously, uh, major emitter major geopolitical player. Um, definitely um, weakness in terms of who has communication access, who has access. Uh, was able to influence even um, beyond having just a conversation. So lots more to be done. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank our panelists, of course, all four, Claire on Zoom, uh, Madura, Shane, Alden here in the room. I want to thank everybody who joined very early on a Monday morning uh, for this breakfast meeting here at E3G. And then, of course, all the people who joined on Zoom, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your contributions. I hope this was interesting. We'll follow up on the open issues in the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Have a great day.